Welcome to the EAU podcast series on Andrology Chronicles, Messages for Men's Health. Join us as we delve into insightful discussions led by Dr. Roland Rees, a consultant urological surgeon and andrologist, alongside Dr. Varu Sadef, a consultant urologist and andrologist both at University of Southampton, United Kingdom. In this first episode, Dr. Rees and Dr. Sadev will explore the varicose cell conundrum and its treatment strategies. Join us as we embark on this informative journey. Well, hi there. Welcome to the Andrology Podcast. Uh, my name is Roland Rees. I'm a urologist in University Hospital Southampton in the UK, and I'm here with my colleague Varun Sardev. And today we're going to talk about uh, the varic seal conundrum. Now, great area of controversy. Hopefully we'll be able to sort this out for you. Um, so Varun, first of all, tell us how common is it? How common is a varic seal and what problems do they cause? Uh, hi, Roland. Well, it is a very common problem. We know that actually it affects 15% mm. uh, of the normal male population. Uh, this is actually higher in men who have an abnormal semen analysis, up to 25% of men, in fact, and up to 35 to 40% of men who are presenting with infertility. So fairly common in, in the sort of infertility cohort. We know that it can cause several problems including subtility we've already discussed, but also failure of testicular growth and development. Uh, it can result in pain or discomfort in the testicular region and can even cause hypogonadism. So quite a few problems for these men. Really. So varicoceles can actually cause infertility. Can you tell us a little bit about the mechanism? What's understood yeah, about that? I mean, I think it's a bit difficult. It's a bit of a, we can't quite say that it causes infertility, but we know that there's a strong association uh, the proposed mechanism for that is increased scrotal temperature, which results in hypoxia, reflux of toxic metabolites, which then results in testicular dysfunction and infertility due to damage to, to DNA. So that's the kind of working theory. Is how okay, but we're not, we're not absolutely sure. How, we're not absolutely how sure. That so we can't, works. can't say with certainty, but that's the, the thought. Okay. Yeah. And okay, so we obviously have different types of infertility. So the big thing really is, does varicocelectomy or varicocele treatment, let's say, does that improve semen parameters? Yeah, this is a topic that's really been debated for quite a few decades now. It's uh, very long standing in the literature. Uh, we, we know that going back to the Evers meth analysis back in 2003, yeah. which still informed some of the guidelines, which we're aware is, is out of date. Sadly. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Sadly, especially in the UK, not so much in Europe. but. Um, Essentially, just to quote, varicocele repair does not seem to be an effective treatment for male subfertility. Now, this has been completely debunked. Really. Turned on its head. It yeah. has, yeah. And there have been several meta-analyses, for example, one by Bazin et al. in 2011. And that clearly shows that in men who've got abnormal semen parameters beforehand, and also a clinical varicocele, importantly, yeah. uh, there is clearly improvement seen in yeah. semen parameters. So that, and that was a systematic review. So just to be clear then, um, if they've got an abnormal semen analysis and they've got a clinical varicocele, one you can either feel or see, mm. then they're, treating those guys will yes. improve their sperm count. Absolutely. And yes. I think from memory, it's, it's the average improvement was around 10 million that's right. Uh, yes, significant per mil in concentration. Yes, yes. So that's um, so that's useful information. Okay. What about um, what about men with oligosuous sperm? Yeah. So men with oligosperm. <clears throat> this has been looked into as well. There's two meta analyses of RCTs which looked into men with clinical varicocele and oligospermia. So we know that there was improved outcomes in these men also, and this can take a, a bit of time. So up to two spermatogenic cycles. And there was even spontaneous pregnancy uh, found, actually. And that took about six to 12 months after the varicocelectomy. Excellent. So there is evidence that it improves pregnancy rates as well as that's right. improving semen parameters. And that's obviously very important for, for uh, couples yes. in the fertility clinic yeah. with a varicocele wondering what to do next. Absolutely. Know? Very important. Um, yeah. What about, okay, so that's the, the infertile couple. But what about an adolescent? Um, maybe it's been discovered incidentally. Maybe they've had some aches and pains there or whatever. Um, how do you manage hmm. those those youngsters who are no, nowhere near wanting to start a family? What do you tell them? Yes, yeah. So it does represent a bit of a challenge because you're at a slight risk of overtreating. Um, because just because they've got a varicocele doesn't mean they're going to be infertile. Yeah. And many of them may go on to have families uh, if they so wish in the future. 
really the guidelines are quite clear about this, that we should keep them under surveillance, Mm -hmm. uh, carry out serial clinical examinations and ultrasounds. And if they have a reduction in the size of the testicle or if they're able to produce a specimen, an abnormal semen analysis, then you should consider treatment. So that that's how to sort of focus your your, your, your treatment protocol really for, for that. Kind of yeah, it is difficult, isn't it? Because lots of people have varicose seals, but it doesn't necessarily mean they will have fertility problems. Mm, uh, it's, exactly. a, it's a really difficult um, exactly. counselling exercise, that one, I think. Yes. Um, now, even more controversial and interesting, what about azoospermics? So there's some, I gather, some uh, studies looking at the effect of varicose seals, varicose seal treatments in men with non-obstructive azoospermia, which is... Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think the overall evidence is a bit less robust, but there have nevertheless been several studies that have looked into this. Uh, for example, one by Sajadi et al. in 2019 looked at patients who had microvaricosilectomy with associated non-obstructive azospermia. And this led to sperm found in the ejaculate in about 14% of cases. So a small number, a small percentage, but nevertheless not insignificant. There's also been a meta-analysis which looked at 468 patients and actually found a higher percentage of men who had sperm ejaculate, up to 44%. Wow, okay. So, you know, quite significant there. So mm. you should, wouldn't, shouldn't discount these, uh, the, these men, really. And uh, there's an argument for counselling the couple. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you need to factor in the time that this may take to actually improve things for them. You're also going to think about female partner, her age, medical history, and ovarian reserve uh, quite carefully to see whether the, the, the timeline fits yeah. for them. Yeah, of course. It's a very, the, these sort of decisions are very individualized, aren't they, uh, in terms of the couple's particular situation? But it's interesting that you can potentially get you know, 40% of men producing sperm. I mean, it's not far off the sperm retrieval rate for, for men with NOA. So Absolutely. you may want to discuss with them whilst you're in there retrieving sperm or trying to retrieve sperm, if they've got a varicose seal, you may want to just tie that off when you're yeah. in there because actually you know, there is a, a bit of a chance that they yeah, may start uh, ejaculating nice. sperm, in which case um, you don't have to keep on using frozen mm. sperm or, yeah, or, re- or surgically retrieve sperm. That's a good, a good thought. You know, especially if they've got <clears throat> time on their side, then certainly it should be considered. And then there's the final aspect, I suppose, is that we talked a lot about fertility there. What about the other function of the testicle, which is obviously to produce testosterone? Is there an association between varicoceles and hypogonadism? And if so, is, is there a link between treating and improving testosterone levels? Uh, the answer is yes to both, actually. So okay. there is certainly an association in terms of hypogonadism in, in the context of, uh, of clinically detectable varicoceles. Um, whether it actually <laughs> improves uh, matters after treatment uh, is the evidence is a little bit scant, and the EAU says more RCTs are needed. However, yeah. there has been a meta analysis by Locke et al. in 2017, which looked into the efficacy of varicose intervention pre and post, uh, and, and looked at pre and post uh, op testosterone levels. And actually, there was a significant improvement in test- <laughs> testosterone levels in these men. So you've got to think about the kind of cost-benefit analysis and ri- and also risk-benefit of surgery versus just saying, well, are you going to mm. just replace the testosterone? And, well, it's very interesting, isn't it? Because a lot of particularly non-neurologists would probably see, see a man with a low testosterone and just say, well, you just need testosterone treatment. Mm. And actually, it's a reminder we need to examine these guys. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as we urologists do, of mm. course. But um, everybody needs to be examining them to see, you know, what are the size of their testes? Have they got a varicose seal uh, before racing into um, supplementing testosterone levels pharmacologically? Okay, there's another interesting area, emerging area, isn't there, between looking um, between uh, varicose seals and, and the quality of sperm DNA and also miscarriage. What, yes. what, what's the story there? What's the evidence for yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. So this is a bit of a hot topic, uh, I think, and uh, there is evidence that. Doing a varicoselectomy can actually improve the sperm DNA integrity, although it's not a, it's a huge a huge amount of improvement in the literature. Mm. But there have been again several uh, systematic reviews and meta analyses which have looked into this, and that actually has, has shown that varicoselectomy does reduce DNA fragmentation rates mm-hmm. uh, in these men, and that might be beneficial uh, in terms of ART, increasing the success of the ART. 
So when you say it might be, um, because that's the, really the critical question, yeah. isn't it? I mean, we know you said earlier on that mm -hmm. treating varicose seals can mm -hmm. improve pregnancy rates in those men who've got mm -hmm. abnormal semen analyses and mm -hmm. a, a clinical varicose seal. But uh, yeah, that, it, I'd say the, the guidelines are a little bit on the fence. I don't mm -hmm. say they certainly should be done if they've got a raised DNA fragmentation. But I think in the context of a patient that's gone through several cycles of treatment mm -hmm. has had a recurrent pregnancy mm -hmm. loss, unfortunately, uh, there's an argument that if the DNA fragmentation is raised and there's no other obvious cause for yeah. that, then actually you I might want to consider... It adds weight to the yeah. case for yeah. doing something, doesn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. There's something to consider, like... but you can't... I can't. Yeah. We can't be definitive about it at the moment. And it sounds like more evidence is, is required. Uh, yeah. Very good. So, final question, Varun, on varicose seals. Um, what what is the best treatment? So, we've decided that this patient of ours needs his varicose seal treated. What are you going to recommend he has done? Well, as a surgeon, obviously, I'd say a microsurgical varicose yeah, of course. and andrologist. You know, obviously, the best, uh, the gold standard. <laughs> uh, this is somewhat going inside, supported by by the literature as well. There was a, a Cochrane review which looked into this in 2021, mm -hmm. and this showed that patients who'd had a microsurgical subinguinal varicoselectomy did have improved rates, uh, pregnancy rates. But it wasn't, they sort of, again, sat on the fence a little bit to say they can't be absolutely conclusive about yeah. it. data. There was also a study by Flora et al. and a subgroup analysis of a systematic review of prospective uh, randomized and non-randomized studies. And this actually did suggest that a surgical approach uh, versus a radiological approach actually did improve pregnancy rates. Now, that wasn't specifically mm. looking at microsurgical techniques, but right. surgery in general. Mm. Uh, but we do need more evidence for this and, and large sort of RCTs. Okay, so that's the subinguinal uh, approach. What are the alternatives and what are the pros and cons of, of those? So the other is a inguinal approach without a microscope, yeah. um, which is carried out probably by more a greater proportion of mm. urologists. That does have a higher recurrence rate compared to the microsurgical approach, so three to thirteen percent versus zero point four. So quite marked there. Yeah. Uh, also, there's a higher rate of hydrocele postoperatively, uh, in the order of seven percent versus zero point four percent. The other surgical options include a high ligation, so a lot of the laparoscopic or minimally yeah. invasive surgeons may uh, go for that. Yeah, uh, that does have a, a bit high more invasive, a bit more invasive. Um, does have a a very high recurrence rate of fifteen to twenty nine percent actually, right. and that's due to the fact that you're not ligating the external spermatic mm. vein. So there's so we shouldn't really be recommending that. No, so that I wouldn't really recommend that approach. Coming on to radiological approaches. The advantage is obviously it's less invasive. There is still a small risk of technical failure, however. So those are the sort of main approaches. There have been meta-analyses which have looked into sort of surgical versus non-surgical approaches. They haven't really found an overall difference in terms of complications, but individual studies, as I've just highlighted, have shown some differences. Yeah. Overall, there is a higher risk of hydrocele following a surgical approach. But really, I think it's safe to say that microsurgical Approach probably is the gold standard. Wins the day. Yeah. Yeah, I certainly see that um, patients who've really done their research come along essentially asking for a mm. subinguinal microsurgical yeah, uh, repair. And what I do is I tend to give them the choice between that and the embolization because they're such different treatments. The yes. embolization is, is minimally invasive. There's no anesthetic. They're in and out quickly. But I do present it a bit like you've done. You know, you you have the pros and cons of each, and then present them equally and say, right, which which should you prefer? Yes. Um, and I think, but I would agree with you that if you're going to go for surgery, that the um, subinguinal approach is probably now the uh, the recommended one. Yes, absolutely. Well, fantastic. So I think we've covered it all. Um, really, we've summed up varicose seals. Difficult topic, mm -hmm. um, but let's summarise. So in conclusion, we would treat men who've got abnormal semen parameters with a clinical varicose seal, not a subclinical. So if it's only detectable in ultrasound, mm. do not recommend treatment. And there's a lot of those. Absolutely. There's a lot of guys walking around with a scan report saying, you know, oh, there's a tiny varicose seal mm. and a bit of reflux, but actually you can't see it, you can't feel it. Um, so those are the ones you won't get a good result from. Um, we should treat adolescents if there's been a reduction in testis volume. 
Um, consider treating varicoceles where there is abnormal DNA fragmentation or you know, with otherwise unexplained infertility, failed um, assisted reproduction, recurrent pregnancy loss, etc. Um, then we can consider varicocelectomy in men with hypogonadism who have got a varicocele. Uh, and finally, as we just said, I think microsurgical varicocelectomy seems to win the day in terms of lowest complication rates and um, recurrence rates, but there are no comparative RCTs on that one. So I think hopefully that summarizes both our opinion and largely the EAU guidelines. And yeah, it's been great to talk through this interesting, challenging topic. Thanks, Baron. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for this insightful episode. We are sure our listeners enjoyed it. To keep up with the latest EAU podcasts and stay informed on urological advancements, be sure to subscribe to our EAU podcast channel on your favorite podcast app. Until next time, keep learning and stay inspired.